Genesis chapter 43. Genesis chapter 43. You know, a lot of people hated school. A lot of you <laughs> hated school. Uh, not because of the learning. Oh man, you hated tests. I, I, could, I was going to ask for a show of hands, but everybody out streaming who hated testing. Thank you, we can't see you. You know, regular quizzes and um, exams are the mark of a good education. A good test exposes a familiarity with the facts and a facility in applying them. It is opportunity to remember and to reason. And sometimes testing is different. I've had the privilege over a number of years of coaching soccer. And when I was coaching, I regularly tested players. We ran them through mental drills designed to test their ability to withstand relentless pressure. Particularly our defensive players. Could they hold up under unending pressure for minutes and minutes and minutes? That's as much a mental thing as anything. We put them through... Combination drills and small game, comp small game competition that exposed skill willingness or, another, or an unwillingness to play what we call both sides of the ball, play offense and defense. And sometimes we tested as to whether individuals were developing as a team. Would small jealousies and jockeying for favor, for starting positions, or even for public acclaim come to surface when loyalty to the cause of the team and playing together was important. This is the kind of testing we most often face from God. Pretty rare that God sits down, hands you a piece of paper with questions on it and says, fill this out. I mean, I haven't had a test like that really when it comes down to it since college, university. God's tests are like soccer tests. They're in the midst of life and living. They are in the midst of the mess. And often God's tests are pop quizzes. You're sailing along, doing really well, and all of a sudden some calamity, some tragedy, something that you weren't expecting happens, and now what's really going on in your heart comes to the fore. And this is the kind of testing that Joseph will put his brothers through. It's intended through trials and unexpected providences to expose their heart. What do they really believe and what do they really want? Are they truly different after all these long years? And so the brothers are going to be tested in this and the next chapter, this one, on their jealousy, and in the next one, on their fidelity or loyalty. Will they be jealous of Benjamin and the favor that will be shown him? Will they allow him to be taken away? Or will Judah keep his word and stand up for his brother? Now, much of this chapter are a studied contrast to chapter 42. Joseph greets them differently. Joseph treats them differently. The brothers respond differently. And Joseph will be tender and solicitous and congenial. And the brothers are humble, curious, hesitant and genuinely surprised at how they are treated. But these two chapters are not about judgment. They are about mercy. They are about how mercy transforms people. Through Joseph, a severe mercy is extended and radical transformation takes place. But all of this is aimed at reconciliation and restoration. For you see, 
Reconciliation, even of Joseph and his brothers, without righteousness, it's a sham. It's fake. It's not genuine. And Joseph well knows that if he truly reunited with his brothers, they need to have dealt with their sins. And he is in a good position to expose their hearts and see if they have truly changed. The deep jealousy of Joseph had caused them to plan to kill him and eventually to sell him into slavery. This final test is designed to see if they will be jealous of another little brother being favored. Now first, they are tested by God through the preparation for the journey in verses 1 to 14. For the sovereign Lord is working to bring the boys back to Egypt. There's a difficult struggle over returning. Verses 1 to 7, Genesis 43, Moses wrote, Now the famine was severe in the land. And when they had eaten the grain that they had brought from Egypt, their father said to them, Go again and buy us a little food. Judah said to him, The man solemnly warned us. He said, You shall not see my face unless your brother is with you. If you will send your brother with us, we will go down and buy you food. But if you will not send him, we will not go down. For the man said to us, you will not see my face unless your brother is with you. And for the first time, I I can't help but just note this. For the first time in this section of the narrative, Jacob is referred to as Israel. Israel said, why did you treat me so badly to tell the man that you had another brother? They replied, the man questioned us carefully about ourselves and our kindred, saying, Is your father still alive? Do you have another brother? What we told him was an answer to those questions. Could we have any way known that he would say, Well, bring your brother down. So the sacks of grain that had sustained them after the first journey are slowly disappearing. Famine is intensifying. A decision to return to Egypt for food is pressing on them. But Jacob and his sons are all aware that in order to return, the youngest son, Benjamin, is going to have to go as well. And Jacob, quite naturally, doesn't want him to go. Jacob again questions why the brothers even told the Egyptian vice regent about their younger brother. In Jacob's mind, they should have kept their mouths shut, and now we wouldn't be in this position. This would not have happened. He's already lost the first son of Rachel, and now Benjamin, the only son of Rachel left, has taken Joseph's place. In Jacob's idolatrous, self-centered heart. How do you think the brothers respond? Think. How does this land on them? You care so much about Benjamin, you would send us down there for nothing if, you don't send, take, if we don't take him. And the brothers point out the man had questioned them thoroughly. They seem to miss the fact that the questions betrayed Well, more knowledge of them than he should have had. But since they were being questioned under suspicion of being spies, they were pretty careful to be truthful because they didn't know what he knew. Judah then stands to ensure the safety of Benjamin in verses 8 to 10. And Judah said to Israel, his father, Send the boy with me, and we will arise and go, that we may live and not die, both we and you and also our little ones. And I will be the pledge of his safety. From my hand you shall require him. If I do not bring him back to you and set him before you, then let me bear the blame forever. And if we had not delayed... We would now have returned twice. 
Well, Judah will bear the blame. He will pledge for the sake of the boy. And you can see in this last sentence a sense of impatience with his father's self-focus and child-centeredness. In the time it finally took to get his dad to agree, they could have made the journey twice. Now, we're not talking about running down to Kroger's. We're talking about a long trip down not only into Egypt, but into probably Thebes, into the capital of Egypt at this time. So this had not been a simple one-time conversation. This appears to have been an ongoing argument as the food is dwindling down. It's a long discussion as hunger draws near. But then Israel, Jacob, makes ample provision for mercy in 11 to 14. Moses wrote, Then their father Israel said to them, If it must be so, then do this. Take some of the choice fruits of the land in your bags and carry a present down to the man and a little balm and a little honey and gum and myrrh and pistachio nuts and almonds. Take double the money with you. And carry back with you the money that was returned in the mouth of your sacks. Perhaps it was an oversight. And take also your brethren, arise and go again to the man. May God Almighty grant you mercy before the man. And may he send back your other brother in Benjamin. And as for me, I am bereaved of my children. I am bereaved. Well, Jacob resigns himself to the inevitable. So he loads up his sons with expensive nuts and spices. He sends twice the amount of money. This money had been set aside. He prepares the sons to pay back the money that had been put in their bags on the last trip. He is reconciled to sending Benjamin, if necessary, to his death. But he does seem to hope in God's mercy. And he seems resigned to whatever unfolds. Now, how often are we like this? We have a situation we really don't like. You think? We have to do something that may be a risk. We're not sure that God is doing what we want. In fact, we're pretty sure he's not. And so will we hope in God's mercy while being ready to submit? We know, the, we know the end of this story, right? Most of us have read Genesis. We know this is where it's going. Jacob don't. He's living in this story. This story is unfolding. He doesn't know what we know, which actually should cause us to smile a little bit. We don't know... The end of our own story, do we? But God does. God not only knows it, but he has ordained it, planned it, decreed it. And the trajectory of our lives is not following a series of random choices. It's not an arrow aimed towards some very large target that the winds of chance can blow and God just in the last moment makes sure it lands on the target. No, no, no. Now, this is a patient walking down a preordained path, and we can't see the next moment, but God does. And we find this testing then in the summons before Joseph. Verses 15 to 25, they'd loaded up their provisions and they head down to Egypt, and they report to stand before Joseph. Now, when Joseph sees that Benjamin has come, he invites them to his house. He sends his steward to prepare a feast. The verse 15 through 17, So the men took this present 
And they took double the money with them and Benjamin. And they arose and went down to Egypt and they stood before Joseph. When Joseph saw Benjamin with them, he said to the steward of his house. Now remember, he's speaking Egyptian and they don't. They are speaking Hebrew and he does. So keep that in mind. Very important over the next three chapters. When Joseph saw Benjamin with them, he said to his steward, Bring the men into my house and slaughter an animal and make ready, for the men are to dine with me at noon. The man did as Joseph told him and brought the men to Joseph's house. So he plans to meet them once again, not in a public space before many eyes, but in the privacy of his home. Oh, you can smell their fear, right? Verses 18 through 22, And the men were afraid, because they were brought into Joseph's house, and they said, It is because of the money which was replaced in our sacks the first time that we are brought in, so that he may assault us and fall upon us to make us his servants and to seize our donkeys. Parentheses, which is exactly what we would do if we were in his place. Right? You always, you always suspect others of doing what you would do if you were in their shoes. So they went up to the steward of Joseph's house and spoke with him at the door of the house and said, Oh my Lord, we came down the first time to buy food and when we came to the lodging place we opened our sacks and there was each man's money in the mouth of, our, of his sack. And our money in full weight. So we have brought it again with us. And we have brought other money down with us to buy food. We do not know who put our money in our sacks. And he, the steward, replied. Peace to you. Do not be afraid. Your God... And the God of your father has put treasure in your sacks for you. I have received your money. They are both baffled and frightened. Fright Hebrew word here is they are terrified. Among themselves they speculate that this Egyptian ruler is going to exact his revenge over the money. Oh, if they only knew who this was. And what thoughts of revenge and vengeance could have lay in his heart. And so they go to the steward to try to explain what had happened. And that they are prepared to make amends. But the steward has his instructions. He knows that they were heading not towards something to fear but to a feast. The only slaughter today would be beef for the table. And he tells them not to be afraid. He then attributes the appearing of their money to the God they serve. Ah, the Egyptian Lord who fears and serves Yahweh has instructed his household in the ways of the Lord. And seems to have even brought this steward the faith in the God of the Bible. Speaks faithfully and familiarly about our God and your God. And then there is the preparation for the meal. And they seem to take him at his word. Verse 24, then he brought out Simeon out to them. And when the, remember, Simeon's been in prison all this time. And when the men had brought the, man, the men into Joseph's house and given them water, and they had washed their feet, and when he had given their donkeys fodder, they prepared the present for Joseph's coming at noon. For they had heard that they should eat bread there. They settle in. They take care of their livestock. They wash and prepare themselves for a meal. And what relief and joy when Simeon appears unharmed. 
Things are really looking up. They're going to be dining with royalty. And as the day wanes on and Joseph arrives home from his work, we are visited with companionship around the table. Verses 26 to 34. Again, Moses wrote, beginning in verse 26, When Joseph came home, they brought into the house to him the present that they had with them and bowed to him to the ground. Dreams do come true. Verse 27, he inquired about their welfare and said, Is your father well? The old man of whom you spoke, is he still alive? And they said, Your servant, our father, is well. And he is still alive. And they bowed their heads and prostrated themselves. And he lifted up his eyes and saw his brother Benjamin, his mother's son, and said, Is this your youngest brother of whom you spoke to me? God be gracious to you, my son. Then Joseph hurried out, for his compassion grew warm for his brother. And he sought a place to weep. And he entered his chamber, meaning his bedroom, and he wept there. And so he gives some assurances by the way he greets them. He meets with his guests and assures them in a kind and a familial greeting. Inquires about their father. He is a kind and genial host. And you can almost see them beginning to relax. Now remember, this is going through a translator. He's speaking Egyptian. They speak Hebrew. And he speaks Hebrew. Verse 29 through 30, he sees Benjamin, Benjamin and his compassion, his love, his mercy wells up in his heart. Ah, this is his closest brother. And he greets him and then seems to remember. <laughs> you shouldn't know him. And addresses him as son. Common way of doing so in Egyptian culture. But his heart is warm to his brother and he has to hurry out to another room, to his bedroom. And there he weeps. In verses 31 to 34, we have the strangeness of the setting. When he returns, they prepare to serve the meal in a typical Egyptian fashion. Joseph does not sit with the Hebrews, for this was an abomination, partly because they are not Egyptian, but also because they are shepherds. Shepherds in the Egyptian culture were dirty, a low class of people. An abomination. And not worthy to sit at the table with, of course, the highborn. Listen to how this works out. Verse 31. And then he washed his face and came out and controlling himself, he said, serve the food. And they served him by himself and them by themselves and the Egyptians who ate with them, him by themselves because the Egyptians could not eat with the Hebrews for that is an abomination to the Egyptians. And they sat before him, the firstborn according to his birthright and the youngest according to his youth. You see what he did? He sat them around the table in birth order. The men looked at one another in amazement. Portions were taken to them from Joseph's table, but Benjamin's portion was five times as much as any of theirs. And they drank and were merry with him. So to their amazement, they are given a seating order. The place of honor and authority was given to the oldest, According to his birthright and around the table they went, according to age, with the youngest Benjamin at the expected place. They cannot help but notice. <laughs> I don't know what to make of it. How could he know this? And so they sit down and are ready to eat. The chargers of food are brought to Joseph's table. The portions are served onto plates. And they watch as five times the amount is taken 
to Benjamin, the youngest, the little guy, if you will. And ah, but there is no jealousy. There are no green eyes among them. All is quiet and well in their souls. They eat and drink and make merry with Joseph. They are happy together. They are just glad for what they are receiving. What do we make of this? How does 1 Corinthians 10 help us to take narratives, stories in the Old Testament? Apply them to ourselves. Now, first, to note that jealousy is not always sin. There is the jealousy of God over His people and the right jealousy of spouses in marriage. Sinful jealousy can be a terrible thing. It has driven great sins. Jealousy over Joseph had driven his brothers to plot to kill him and eventually to sell him. Jealousy led to the first murder in the Bible. Jealousy fueled the sale of Joseph into slavery. Jealousy of David ruled the heart of King Saul. The Pharisees were jealous of Jesus' initial popularity. And we see the dreadful effects of this sin all through the Bible. In Acts 17, the Jews were jealous of Paul. And the church. But jealousy was also an issue in the church of Paul's day. Consider Romans 13, verses 13 and 14. Paul writing, Let us walk properly in the daytime, not in orgies or drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality. And we all say, Amen. That's right, Paul. Not in quarreling. And jealousy. Oh me. Ouch. Now you're meddling. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Now I want you to notice the connection between quarreling and jealousy. We saw it in this story that is unfolded around Joseph and his brothers. Jealousy can ruin relationships, destroy families, and corrupt ministry. Fighting and arguing is often rooted in ministry and personal jealousies. These kinds of heart cravings and behaviors are not the way as we as Christians should live. So while we tend to minimize quarreling and jealousy as acceptable sins, we look the other way. But look at the other sins that are in this category. Orgies, drunkenness, immorality, and sensuality. When you look at Paul's sin lists, sometimes in the middle of them are some pretty scary stuff. In this text, quarreling and jealousy, and another, coveting. Equated with idolatry. Really? Do we really believe that? And Paul confronts the church at Corinth by saying in 1 Corinthians 3.3, 3, For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not then of the flesh and behaving only in a very human way? And he also writes in verse uh, 24, I fear that perhaps when I come I may find you not as I wish, that you may, not find, may find me not as you wish, and that perhaps there may be quarreling and jealousy and anger and hostility, slander, gossip, conceit, and disorder. This from 2 Corinthians 12.20. So at the beginning and end, and look at jealousy's prominent place in the works of the flesh. In Galatians 5.18-21. through 21. Paul writing, But if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, orgies. And things like this, I warn you, as I warned you before, 
that those who do such things, meaning keep on doing such things, will not inherit the kingdom of God. And so, this thing with Joseph and his brothers is no small thing. Those who continually express the works of the flesh are not a part of God's kingdom. This is sobering. Joseph's brothers are repenting of their jealousy and are showing the fruits of that repentance in the way they respond to Benjamin. But we are taught something very important in the Romans text. We just don't stop at being jealous. We don't just stop being jealous. Because you see, that would be simply be moralism. Or even at its worst, legalism. Now listen again to what Paul wrote. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Instead of these things, put on Jesus and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. So how do we deal, how do we overcome the cluster of sins of which jealousy is a part? First, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Consciously, intentionally, and by faith, close yourself in the graces and mercy of Jesus. In its simplest form, be like him. And secondly, make no provision for the flesh. Do not make it easy to be jealous of others. Watch over your own life so that you tend to admire and to congratulate people rather than covet their abilities and compete for the recognition they have rightly received. And don't organize your life to satisfy the desires of the old person and the flesh. This is a purpose clause in jealousy. This means that you do not script out in your mind, fantasize, think about, imagine what it would be like to be in their place, to have their recognition, to be them. What you would do instead. In fact, how much better things would be if you were in their place. So here's the great test for all of us. How would Joseph's brothers respond to the elevation and favor shown to Benjamin? Will they grumble and complain and quarrel and argue and be secretly happy if he doesn't come home? Or they, will they make merry around the table and rejoice in his recognition? And how will you respond to the favor, the recognition, the promotion of someone around you? Maybe in ministry, maybe at your job, in the church. May God grant we will recognize the sin of jealousy, that we will repent from it, and we will put on Christ, whose grace and love toward others is what we put on. Father, before you we bow and ask that you might first grant us the grace of guilt, that we might see and recognize where we are sinning in this very particular way. And yes, it may be buried in a cluster of other junk in our life. But where there is quarreling and division and difficulty, there is often at its root jealousy. And may we be willing to look with clear-eyed, spirit-given, grace-enabled vision and abhor it as you do. That we would repent from it and turn away and put on Christ and stop fantasizing and thinking out and scripting out and even sadly plotting out what we would do. Rather grant that like Joseph, we would be gracious and merciful and then we would be living out Jesus Christ in our lives. We ask these things for the glory of our Redeemer and Ruler. Amen. Let's stand and sing together.